Welcome to the Data Converter part of the seminar. My name is Hank Zambalin. What we'll be talking about today is the data converter in the signal chain. We'll talk about why we want to do data conversion, how we do it, uh, some of the basic concepts of uh, sampling theory. We'll talk about signal processing in the digital domain versus the analog domain. We'll spend some time talking about driving ADD converters, which, as it turns out, is something a little more difficult than what it might seem at first. The primary reason for that is the difference in input structures and the loads that they present to the uh, driving circuits. We'll also spend some time talking about uh, our DAC. Here we have a signal chain. Now, the, the details may vary by signal amplitude or frequency, but the basic concept remains the same, whether we're talking about an industrial process control, or a radio. In the top half, we have some kind of stimulus that we're measuring. We bring it in, shape the input for amplitude and frequency, put it into a converter, take a look at the information, make some uh, decisions based on that, and then we write that to a converter, which then goes out to the environment, either as a control or some other type of signal. We'll be talking about the A to D converter first. Okay, analog signals are continuous. They provide us with all the information that we require in the signal. Digital, when we do a digital representation of the signal, we can only capture a portion of the signal. It is, by definition, going to have to be limited in its resolution in terms of amplitude and in frequency as well. So, if it's limited, why would we digitize? One reason we would digitize is to improve the signal analysis potential because we can now store the information more reliably and transmit that information back and forth that we can then take and process this information in, in some cases as time requires, not necessarily in real time. And when we digitize it, it also gives us some error correction capabilities so that when we do store it or transmit it, we can do error checking to make sure that what we received is what was transmitted. Why not digitize? Primarily cost and complexity. Uh, in certain aspects, we may have signals and control loops that don't really require digitization because there's no really value added to go through the expense. At the other end of the spectrum, in some cases, when we're talking about very high-speed signals, the amount of processing we can do in real time is limited because all the processing has to be done between the sample times, and as we go up in frequency, the sample times are reduced. So here's the general purpose A to D converter. Obviously, we have an analog input and a digital output. But in addition to that, we must have power supplies, in this case VDD and VSS, now, historically, we had 10-volt signals with 15-volt supplies. Today, that's really the case. In most cases, we have reduced power supplies, uh, 5 volts or even less. And in many cases, we have single supplies where the VSS or the negative potential will be actually ground. In some converters, we also have a separate supply for the digital output. This allows us to have... A, for instance, plus and minus 5 volt input range and a 3 volt digital output to interface to our peripherals. In all cases, the analog input is measured against our reference, hence the name. The reference is generally included in the A to D converter. In some cases, we may get advantage in terms of reduced drift, more stability, we also can then tie possibly multiple converters together so that they track with the same reference because, again, the analog signal is measured against our reference. We also need a sampling clock. We talk about this in a little bit, but all of sampling theory is based on the fact that we sample at discrete time intervals, and those time intervals are exactly the same from sample to sample. In many cases, the sampling clock is included in the converter. Uh, in, many in some cases, especially in high speed, we actually have to provide a separate sampling clock. There are also some control elements typically involved. Uh, control signals such as convert start and end of conversion or data ready or something along those lines. In 
precision converters, which are the lower speed version. And when we talk about precision, generally we're talking about things up to 10 megahertz or more correctly, 10 mega sample per second um, data rates. At, in most cases, the precision converters, the digital bus is shared between the data and the control lines. With higher speed converters, typically the data bus is restricted stick, strictly to the uh, data output signals, and there's a separate, I typically slower serial bus for the controls. So here's a sample data system. We have a signal, which we call here F of A, or an analog frequency, that's being sampled at discrete time. And at those discrete times, we get discrete amplitude quantizations, which is what we're showing here. Now, every time sample is stored separately, and again, we assume that every, the, this, the time between every sample is exactly uniform from sample to sample. If we take the output, the digital output, we have to have some kind of relationship to understand how it relates to the input. If we have a unipolar signal that is from ground to some maximum level, the output is generally unipolar coded, which means we go from zero to full scale depending on the input as it goes from zero to the reference. If we have bipolar signals, it becomes a little more complicated because now we're swinging above and below our reference. Now, a bipolar signal can be above and below ground, which is how we tend to think of it normally, or it can be above or below a common mode reference. But the idea is that the output swings above and below our reference, and so we have to be able to distinguish plus from minus. There's many ways to do this. The two more popular are offset binary and two's complement. You have to understand which one you're looking at. They're related, so it's easy to convert between one and the other, but you have to understand which one it is you're actually using. This is a very important slide. What we need to do here is understand what quantization levels we're actually dealing with as we move up in resolution. All things being equal, we'd like to get as much resolution out of our system as we possibly can because that means the granularity of the input is much more defined because the step from one digital output to the next is getting smaller and smaller. Quite often we're talking about 12-bit systems kind of as a standard in industrial we tend to move towards 16 bits, and in some cases, we start to get more involved in that all the way up to 24 bit. But look how the size of the LSB changes over that range. Now, this is done for the standard industrial 10 volt input signal. So you can see that it, at 12 bits, the size of the LSB is 2.44 millivolts. If we go to 16 bits, that drops down to 1. 153 microvolts, and if we go to 24 bits, that drops down to 600 nanovolts. Now, just as a form of comparison, if we take a 2.2 K ohm resistor and hold it in the air, it will have a Johnson noise, which is the thermally induced noise in the just from the molecules moving inside the resistor over a 10 kilohertz bandwidth, the 2.2 K ohm resistor will have approximately 600 nanovolts of noise. So you can see that's one LSB at 24 bits. Now, this is at 10 volt full scale. Quite often today, we're working with things like 5 volt full scale, 2 volt full scale, or even 1 volt. When you can see that, that's going to make a difference because, for instance, if we have a 1 volt full scale, all of these numbers will be divided by a factor of 10. So what kind of accuracy do we need? Well, in general, most sensor resolution accuracy is something on the order of half a percent. That's one part in 200. Eight bit um, equivalence is one part in 256. So you can see that that's fairly coarse compared to the resolution of our, of our sensor. More common is a 12 bit, which is one part in 4,000. 
Now, even though the one part in 4,000 is much greater than the accuracy, it allows discrimination of small changes inside the rated accuracy of the part, which allows us to do uh, corrections and the like. So here's the transfer function for a DAC and A to D. We'll talk about the A to D first. As the analog input, which is the x-axis, goes from zero to full scale, the digital output, which is the y-axis, goes from 000 to 111 in the staircase fashion. Now you can see that the answer is, is exactly correct only at one point in the center of the uh, digital word. That is a quantization uncertainty that is basically a noise function that's impossible to get rid of. You can reduce it by increasing the resolution of the converter. This is a 3-bit converter, which is fairly coarse, but it, it shows the point. If we were to try to put a 12-bit up there, the step sizes would be very small. But again, we only are exactly correct in one spot, and the resolution determines what the quantization uncertainty is going to be. In a DAC, as we increase the digital code in the x-axis this time, the analog output increases monotonically as well from zero to full scale. Note that there is also a quantization uncertainty here. The DAC can only put out discrete values of DC. It does not put out a continually varying uh, signal, only discrete levels. And we'll get into this a little bit more in a couple of slides. When we talk about errors in data converters, we basically talk about two sets of parameters, the DC parametrics and the AC parametrics. We talk about DC, basically we describe them in LSBs, percent of full scale, or depending on how small that percentage is, we can convert that to part per million. There are basically a couple of things that we need to look for. One is offset error. If we go back to the slide where we had the analog input coming up, if we have an offset error, we have a little bit added or subtracted to that line as it goes through its transitions. The slope of the line stays the same. The line stays straight, but every point has something added to it, similar to the offset in an, in an op amp. The other is the gain error. In a gain error, the slope of the line changes so that as we go from zero to full scale, instead of reaching the full scale, we're either going to be above or below it a little bit. That error is added increasingly as we go up in our measurements. So again, the slope of the line changes. We can also have a nonlinearity. In a nonlinearity, the line is no longer straight. Common ways to see this is a bow where you're higher in the center and on in both ends. Sometimes you can see an S shape uh, curve or some other uh, general shape. Anyways, it's, it's how much you deviate from a straight line. Now, when we talk about linearity, there's two ways to talk about it. One is differential nonlinearity. This is the code, the code deviation from exactly one LSB. As we move from code to code, some are going to be a little bigger, some are going to be a little smaller. What we try to do is make sure that all the transitions stay within a small enough range that all of our code transitions are covered. We also have AC parametrics. AC parametrics basically is a distortion type of measurement where we have the signal that we want and then we have everything else. So when we take a distortion measurement, basically what we do is we take the signal we're supposed to have away, we measure everything else, and that's our distortion. We can put that as signal to noise ratio, which is going to be in dB. We can convert that to equivalent number of bits. We can also specify the distortion in several different ways. We can talk about harmonic distortion. We can talk about intermodulation distortion. We might identify the worst harmonic. In some cases, we really don't care what the distortion component is. We just care that it's there. So we have our THD in percent or dB. We can have equivalent number of bits where we take that percent 
or db and convert it into equivalent number of bits, we have to define the analog bandwidth. It just says an amplifier has a full power bandwidth that's less than a small signal bandwidth. The front end of an analog converter will have basically the same type of specifications. Small signal typically is defined at something that's 20 dB down from full scale. When we start getting up into radio frequencies, we talk about something called spurious free dynamic range. Spurious free dynamic range is the difference from a full scale output to the highest spur of any of any sort when you're looking at uh, an FFT spectrum. We don't care if that spur is from harmonic distortion, intermodulation distortion, clock feed through uh, some other type of, of source. It makes no difference. We only care what the smallest differential to the full scale to the highest peak is going to be. In some cases, we measure it relative to the carrier level. Uh, in most cases, if you're looking at the, uh, a data sheet for a converter, you're going to have it measured against full scale because that's the only way to, to kind of equalize and make an apples to apples comparison. Anytime you have a uh, system, there's going to be some nonlinearity in that system. We try to keep that nonlinearity down, but there's always going to be some. The if we take two tones and, mix, and put them through a nonlinear system, there'll be a small amount of mixing going on, just like you'd have in a, in a regular mixer, and you develop some in different frequencies. That's intermodulation distortion. So it's defined as two-tone intermodulation, three-tone or more. Three is used a lot because what that tends to do is put spurs in very close to the uh, original signal, which makes them very hard to, to filter out. We can add more and more tones till we get to noise power ratio, which is basically Gaussian noise mixed together, where you have an equal distribution of all possible frequencies. And what you do in the noise power ratio is notch out a section of the, of the response, look to how that gets filled back in, and that gives you your noise power. Adjacent channel leakage is a term that's used quite often in things like cell phones. In a cell phone, you have a basic frequency that has time, has frequency slots for each individual conversation. And if you're talking on the phone, you don't want somebody who's in an adjacent channel signal to mess with yours, uh, especially in something like a cell phone, because the relative amplitudes of the two signals can vary widely depending on how close or far away you are from the uh, cell site. There's also a few other things like noise figure, which is kind of an RF measurement as well. And then there's certain things that when we over voltage a converter, there's going to be some settling time and overload recovery time. Things we like not to do to, to converters, but does happen on occasion. So here's our basic A to D converter. This is a comparator. The way this works is that if the inverting or minus input is greater in amplitude than the positive or non-inverting input, then the output is going to be low. Conversely, if it's the other way around, the output's going to be high. Now, what happens in a comparator is as we reach that point of transition where the two signal levels are very much the same, a small amount of noise, given the high gain of the comparator, can cause the output to switch rapidly between high and low as it goes through the transition. So to deal with that, we develop something called hysteresis, which is a positive feedback, which means that as we go up, the transition level is not quite the same as as we go down. And what that does for us is it gives us cleaner signals with a small amount of, of what you might be considered dead space in between. Now, we don't use the one bit A to D converter in very many places, but it is a basic building block of all of the other types of converters. So. That's why we talk about it here. Now we talked about the transfer function and how the digital output is only an exact replica at one point along the line. And again, we have a three bit converter here 
and we see that there's going to be an error function, the quantization uncertainty we talked about earlier. And if we graph that out, we get the sawtooth wave that uh, we're showing at the bottom here. The RMS value of that is the LSB divided by 3.464, or the other way you quite commonly see it is the LSB divided by the square root of 12. That's a noise function that you can't get rid of. It's the uncertainty in the quantization of the signal. The only way you can affect that is to go to a higher resolution converter and shorten the LSB to make that smaller. So then the RMS error value will be smaller. But then there are other issues, as we talked about, that then if the LSB becomes very small, um, noise becomes a much bigger issue. We also need to worry about time. Here we have three different frequencies, all being sampled at the same time. In the bottom, we have 10 samples for every cycle of our input. In the middle, we have 10 samples for every 11 cycles of our input. And in the top, we have 10 samples for every 21 cycles of our input. And if then we take a look at just the value of the samples, we see that they're exactly the same. So how do you tell one from the other? You can't. Once it's digitized, the information is going to be lost and you can't really tell one from the other. This is why we have to band limit the inputs of converters to make sure that we know the frequency. So we know that it would, would have been one cycle or 21 cycles, depending on um, which it is. This is something that's called aliasing, and it's based on Nyquist criteria. The Nyquist criteria says that a signal with a maximum bandwidth of f of a must be sampled at a rate twice that, or information will be lost because of aliasing. Now, most people, when they think of Nyquist criteria, they think of maximum frequency, but it turns out that it's really bandwidth because if you band limit the signal coming in, that information is just as valid as if you're working in the baseband. And in point of fact, sometimes that is used in high-speed converters for things like radios where we're talking about a fairly narrow bandwidth at a very high frequency because we can do that much easier than we can do a baseband converter that goes all the way up to that, that frequency. So here's an analog representation of that phenomenon. In the top we have a frequency. We have our sample rate at f of s and 2 of f of s. We have half f of s, which is our Nyquist frequency. And then we're also showing 1 and a half times f of s as a, as a marker. So in the top signal, our analog input signal is well within our baseband. And what we're going to see is that we develop images which is what the I stands for, images that are plus and minus f of a above and below f of s. So the second image in from the left, well, first image, but the second line in from the left is going to be f of s minus f of a. Then the next one over is going to be f of s plus f of a. And that replicates at every harmonic of the sample rate. So you can see the same thing around 2f of s. And if we were to show it, it would go on theoretically all the way up. So now if we take and violate the criteria, and we now take our analog input so that it's very close to f of s, we now have images that are very close to our base bands. For instance, what I'm saying here is that f of a, the first image to the left would then be f of s minus f of a. The next image over is actually 2 f of s minus, plus, yeah, minus f of a. The next image over is f of s plus f of a, and then actually the next one is 3 f of f s minus f of a so you can see that these signals all look the same and we can't really tell the difference and in point of fact as i said before we may use a process called undersampling to actually take advantage of that and mix our signal down into the baseband 
So while the Nyquist criteria says that we can sample all the way up to half the, uh, we can have signals all the way up to half of our sample rate, it's really not true because we have to be able to, to differentiate our signals from our aliases. So we need to filter, which is what we talked about in the beginning, where we have a filter before our A to D converter, an anti-aliasing filter. So the way to figure that out is you have a certain dynamic range requirement in your system, 12-bit, 16-bit, whatever it is. So you're gonna, if you have a signal at f of a, you're also going to have a signal of f of s minus f of a. So what we need to do is make sure that our filter attenuates the images to below our dynamic range so that they don't, uh, interfere with our signal. So we can see here it's fairly steep slope on the on the filters. So if we make f of a a much smaller percentage of our Nyquist frequency or conversely if we're to increase our sample rate by a factor of k in, in a process called oversampling, you can see that we've reduced the requirements on the filter considerably, which makes it much easier to build, i.e. much more reliable and much less expensive. So while theory says we can go all the way up to f of s, in practice we can't typically do that. Today we're seeing a lot of converters that have differential inputs. Now differential inputs uh, have some advantages over single-ended in that it gives you twice the signal swing versus a single-ended system. Okay, the single-ended system, you would have the signal against a fixed reference. In a differential input, you have that signal against something that's the opposite phase of that. So it's swinging at t the total swing as you go from peaks to valleys of one side of the signal to the other are twice what you get in a single-ended system. So that gives you 6 dB or 1 bit of uh, increased resolution. Some other happy things happen. For instance, the differential input tends to suppress even order distortion products and noise generated that's coupled into both phases of the signal becomes a common mode signal and gets taken out in the conversion process. Many components, especially in the RF and IF field, tend to be differential by nature. Soft filters and mixers are two examples. So um, it may be more convenient just to keep the whole signal string differential, rather go from differential to single and back up to differential. Differential ADDs designs also allow better internal component matching than single-ended, so there's less need for trimming, less uh, cost to the manufacturer, less cost to the customer. It also helps minimize the effects of noise on the ground. Now, if we could go back in time when people started using our reference node, ground, as a power supply return as well, we would discourage them from doing that because that just makes it harder to to build our high resolution systems. But that boat has sailed. There's nothing we can do about it now. So by bringing the signals off the of ground, we're going to separate ourselves a little bit from that added noise. Now you can take a differential, amp, differential input and drive it single-endedly, but you'll get a slight uh, degradation in performance because you've cut your signal level down by a factor of two, so you lose one bit, but you can still do it. So here we have an example of what it takes to drive an A to D converter. In this particular instance, we're talking about a 18-bit, uh, 400 kilosample per second part. Now, when we're trying to figure out the drive requirements, we know what our input signal is going to be. In this particular instance, it's a plus or minus 10 volt, the standard in industrial rate. And what we try to do is then stuff that into the input of the A to D converter, keeping in mind what it wants to see. So we start there and we can just figure out what our gains need to be and so we can design our circuit. Okay, so now the input range, this is a single supply part operating on 5 volts. So um, the input range is 8.192 volts 
peak-to-peak -peak differential. So that means from our common mode reference, each phase is going to swing 4.096 volts. So let's just call it 4 volts for convenience. So what we want to do is provide a common mode reference. It's going to be halfway in between there. So that's going to equal 2.1 volts. So if you can see on the left side of this, we have two resistive divider strings that are going to set up our biasing arrangements. Now they're slightly different voltages because of the fact we have slightly different gains in the two stages. So we come into the bottom. We're going to scale this plus and minus 10 volt signal down so that we have a plus and minus 4 volt signal. So we're going to gain it up appropriately. This particular device that we're using to drive it, the ADA4941, has an uncommitted amplifier, which we see on the bottom, and then an inverting buffer, which is going to give us the exact same amplitude in opposite phase, and those become our two differential outputs. Now, anytime we have an active device, there's a certain amount of noise that's going to be associated with those circuits. In this case, the noise of the driver amplifier is 10.2 nanovolt per root hertz. Okay. Now, the 400 kilosample rate means that we can put signals at up to half of that. So let's just say 200K uh, into the into the amplifier. So what we want to do is put a filter in to limit the noise of the driver chip because the bandwidth of that is considerably above the 200 kilohertz. To limit the noise, because remember noise is a per root hertz type of number, and we want to limit that so we don't materially degrade the performance of the A to D converter. So if we take a look at it, we choose arbitrarily a 1 megahertz cutoff frequency for that low pass filter. This is not an anti-aliasing filter. This is simply a noise reduction filter. We will assume that the anti-aliasing part has taken place before the signal gets to the driver circuit here. Okay, so what that means is, if we see on the bottom, that after the filter, the noise of the 10 nanovolt per root hertz over the megahertz bandwidth becomes 13 microvolts RMS due to the amplifier. Okay, given the signal of 8 volt peak to peak differential, that means our signal to noise ratio is going to be 107 dB. The signal to noise ratio of the converter itself is 100 dB, so we're 7 dB better than that and we have not materially degraded the performance of the converter. Here's another example of a part that uh, we're actually using a differential amplifier to drive it. Same basic concept, just handled a little bit differently. In this case, um, the differential in, differential out amplifier, we buy, it has a special V common mode pin. So that actual voltage is provided by a port on the A to D converter itself which will give a voltage that's approximately half of its input span, in this case 2.4 volts. We have a 50, ended, 50 ohm single-ended signal coming in. We're going to terminate that in its characteristic impedance, put that through the amplifier, and in then, then into the converter. Now, you take a look here, the 65.5 ohm it's not exactly 50 ohms, but you actually have 200 ohms, which is the input resistor, in parallel with that. So that combination turns out to be 50 ohms. And if you'll notice, for symmetry, we'd expect the four resistors across the amplifier to be the same. But notice that the input resistor on the bottom leg is not. But what that is, is it's the 200 ohms that you would expect to see plus the 50 ohm input terminated with 50 ohms or 25 ohms added to it. So that's where the 226 uh, comes from. We also have the noise filter like we saw before. The noise of the input is 5 nanovolt per root hertz. We're going to choose a 
bandwidth here that will keep the noise. The input bandwidth of the A to D converter is 270 megahertz. So what we're going to do is um, check out what the output noise is going to be. That's going to be 103 microvolts for the frequency that we've set up here, which is um, 270. And we convert that to dB, and it's 77.5 dB. Okay, the input noise of the ADD converter is 75 dB. So again, we've um, we've not materially affected the performance of the chip. We don't have quite as much available as we had the first time, but it's it's close. So we're going to now talk about the difference in input structures of converters. Now this has more to do with high speed than with precision converters. But what happens is on a bipolar, generally a bipolar uh, converter will have a buffered input, which means it presents a fairly constant load to the drivers. This is really easy to deal with. That's a, this is the kind of situation we like to see. However, quite a few of our high-speed converters have a switch capacitor. They're a CMOS type structure. They have a switch capacitor type input, which gives us our um, sample and hold functionality as well. And in those particular uh, types of circuits, we see a widely varying input uh, impedance presented to the driver, which makes it a little bit tougher to deal with. So again, we like buffered inputs because they they, gener they present a nice standard load. However, we can see that the switch capacitor input varies quite a bit. And that's what we're showing here. This is a measured performance of a 12-bit 80 mega sample converter, the AD9236. And you can see that there's a significant difference between the real and imaginary components of the hold mode and the track mode. So the way we can deal with that is in a process called resonant matching. We can do it either a series resonant match or a parallel resonant match. Both are equally valid. The main difference between these two is that with the series resonant mode, when we get our match, there's a minimum in the impedance. And if you use a parallel resonant mode, the match is at the maximum of the impedance. And that just makes it a little bit easier to drive. So in general, the parallel resonant format is the one we want to use. Does it make a difference? Well, here's in a couple of spectrum we can show you. The left one is without the impedance matching network. You can see that with the um, matching network, which is on the right, we've reduced the number of spurs and the amplitude of those spurs uh, considerably. The SNR is improved by a, fact, by a factor of 10.7 dB, and that's, that's pretty significant. Uh, improvement. Now we're going to talk about the uncertainty caused by the sampling. Uh, actually the same thing before sampling and clocking occurs. And again, we, we expect every sample to be exactly the same interval, but there's always going to be a little bit of variation between sample to sample timing. And we've exaggerated it here. But if we get sample to sample variation, with the delta T RMS that we're showing here. You can see if we then reflect that on an analog input that has a fairly high slope, we can get a variation in our sample voltage, which is delta V RMS. And that's a certain amount of, of noise that is impossible to get out of the system. And if we take a look at the theoretical signal noise and conversely, the equivalent number of bits just due to jitter. These are the kind of numbers we see. So as an example, if we want 10 bits equivalent at 10 megahertz, we figure out where the intersection of those two lines are, and it's going to be something around 10 picoseconds. So the, the signal-to-noise ratio called only by jitter. 
No other uh, factors involved. Of 10 picoseconds would give you 10 equivalent number of bits at 10 megahertz. So when we talk about clocks, what does that mean? Well, if you're talking about things in the order of, say, 0.33 nanoseconds, well, I'm sorry, picoseconds, then we can generally handle that with a uh, phase lock loop with a VCO. If we want a little bit more precision, we can use a phase lock loop with a VCXO, a crystal oscillator, and that will give us some uh, improved performance. And then if we need uh, to get even better than that, we'd have to go to a dedicated low noise crystal oscillator, which is going to be very expensive, very complicated, and very hard to deal with. As an example, when we profile our A to D converters, to, to manage the specs on them, we want to make sure we get as much uh, performance out of the part as we possibly can. And so we use crystal oscillators that generally go in at about $1,500 a piece, which is obviously not a viable option for a lot of systems. We do make a series of clock drivers, a couple of different series of clock drivers, and this is the kind of performance that you can expect to see out of them. Let's talk about decoupling for a second. Here's an evaluation board, in this case a 9445, with all of the uh, decoupling done on the board. And you can see we get a pretty clean output spectrum. If we take a look at the pins on the part, we see that there's multiple powers, multiple grounds. And the reason is that if we parallel all of these pins together, it lowers the impedance going in, which gives us a uh, better performance. If we take off the caps from the analog supply, you can see that we've got much more fuzz on our spectrum. Now, when they did this, they actually took measurements with every one of the uh, capacitors taken off individually. And when they did that, if you were to plot the signal to noise ratio versus capacitors taken off, it was a linear until it got to the to where it uh, rolled off for a flat response, which is what we're seeing here. But if you take a look, compared to our original spectrum, this has got a lot more noise components. And if we take a look at what happens when we take off the digital uh, capacitors as well, we get them even much worse components. So decoupling is something we need to do with these parts. We have a tool called SimADC, which is very useful in trying to home in on exactly what kind of converter you want to use. You put in some parameters here, it'll suggest parts, you take a look at the basic performance, dial in some numbers, and it'll give you a uh, spectrum. It will also tell you if you've done some things that are, are kind of shaky. In this case, we've used a signal that's a integer multiple of the of the sample rate, and that's going to mean that we're going to decrease our signal to noise ratio considerably, and it gives us a warning. And you see the warning in the red box down there telling us uh, what we've done that's not optimum. That's rolled up together with our visual analog signal, which is, uh, again, it, it's kind of like, think of it as spice. It's not spice because it's not a component level uh, simulation. It's a functional simulation, but we spend a lot of time trying to make sure that what you get in the simulation is what you would see on the on the part itself. This is available as a download from our web and uh, can work with all of our evaluation boards in seamless fashion as well. There's some other tools available like the SPI controller. Basically what it does is you put in the the part you're going to use and it'll give you a register map and help you try to figure out what you need to write each one of those registers to configure the part correctly. Now ADCs require reference. The input level is always compared to the reference so it's very important. In many cases A to D converters have references built in. Um, this is something that, that reduces the cost and it also is, is an advantage because all the specifications that you're going to see in the data sheet are typically going to be made against the internal reference on the part. Now you can, in many cases, not all, but many cases you can override that internal reference with an external reference 
And the reasons you might want to do that is for higher accuracy, uh, lower drift, that type of thing. Some other things you might want to do is, is have one reference that's attached to several ADD converters so that they all track together. And in many cases, you may want to uh, change slightly what the reference voltage is. For instance, if you have a 5-volt reference and, and a 12-bit system, you're going to have a, um, a certain size of LSB. And if you go to a 4.096, that size of the LSB will then become exactly 1 millivolt per bit rather than one point something, which would be the case with a 5 volt reference. Now, in some cases, you can use the power supply as a reference. That tends to be less desirable in many cases because of primarily noise issues. But in something like a sigma delta converter that does massive oversampling and then actually averages the parts together, that cleans up a lot of the noise issues. And so it becomes a valid choice uh, for sigma delta. Here's a comparison of the different types of references. You can have buried zeners, band gap references. Um, you can see the zeners tend to be slightly higher voltages. Band gap tend to be lower. The XFET is a variation on the band gap that uses uh, FETs instead of bipolar transistors as the um, core of the reference. And the X comes from an extra diffusion that they do on one of the JFETs in a differential pair so that they get much, very precise differential. And basically, the easiest way to say it is the XFETs tend to be our more precise uh, types of references. There is an evaluation wizard available also that will allow you uh, to select the parts. So let's talk about DACs. Uh, again, a DAC puts out discrete voltage levels at discrete time intervals. It does not put out a continuously varying signal. What happens is we, we integrate the uh, individual le levels, which we're showing in the reconstructed signal where we have the boxes. The boxes are what the actual output of the DAC will look like. We put that through a smoothing filter and we get the analog output. Now, on top of what we'd expect to see with ideal transitions, we can also have glitches. And the glitch comes from the fact that uh, current sources are turning on and off, and the propagation delay of the parts from one switch to another may not exactly be the same. So all these things may not work precisely at the same time. And when we measure the glitch, it's always going to be a time voltage type of measurement. Now, as you start to go up in frequency, and we try to, to squeeze as much out of the Nyquist frequency as we possibly can, the integration of these square boxes gives us a response that we have to put on top of our uh, response of our filter that's called a sine x over x roll-off. You can see that the, the slope of this, we have nulls at the sample rate and all of its multiples. And if we talk about the Nyquist frequency, which is half the sample rate, you can see that we're already down due to the sine x over x roll-off, approximately 4 dB. In many of our high-speed convert uh, high-speed DACs, we'll find a uh, little filter that's put in before the signal goes to the DAC itself to try to compensate for that roll-off and give us as flat a response out to the Nyquist frequency as we can possibly get. So you can see that here that uh, the other thing we can do is to go to uh, oversampling. And so you can see here that if we double the clock, the roll off due to sine x over x becomes much more flat and the, the filter requirements of the reconstruction filter become less and less because now we've moved that image out uh, away from the, our input signal by quite a bit. And that's what we're kind of showing here. We have a, a frequency that we're trying to get out, which is the blue line. And then we have all these images, and you can see that the image, because of the fact that our sample rate is very close, now the image is very close to our signal, and it becomes very hard to, to get out of the system. By using a process called interpolation, we increase the relative or apparent sample rate so that we can go either two, four, eight times 
and move those frequencies further and further apart so it becomes less and less of an issue. And basically the way that's set up is we have our data and clock coming into the converter. We then use a phase lock loop and multiply our frequency of our clock by a factor of depending on the part 2, 4, or 8. That goes in then to a digital interpolation filter where basically we stuff zeros in and then average things out and increase the apparent data rate that goes into the DAC itself. And by that, we also then tend to move our sine x over x curve out and our images out. And here's an example of what we would see with that when we're trying to uh, look at the spectrum. Using a standard DAC, at close to Nyquist, you can see that the images are, are relatively close to our, our signal, but by going to an interpolation DAC, those images now are moved uh, further away and become much easier to uh, filter out. So what we've covered today is some uh, signal processing type information, some basics of sampling theory and how it relates to converters. We've talked about driving inputs on ADCs, and we've talked about DACs for high speed and high resolution. We've talked about a couple of different tools, and the last thing I'd like to close out with is the fact that we have, by necessity, made this a very fast presentation. We had a lot of information to give you in a very short period of time. So if you want to go into more detail, here's a book that's written specifically for data converters that can be bought as a book, and it can also be downloaded as PDF files from our analog dialog site, and I've got the, uh, the link listed there. And a lot of that information is also included in the Linear Circuit Design Handbook, which has uh, the advantage of covering amplifiers, other sorts of sensors, and some things outside of data converters to give you an idea of what it takes to run the whole, uh, whole analog system. And at that, I'd like to thank you for your time and hope you learned something out of this.